Coming to you from the heart of the Diocese of Savannah, this is It's Catholic, Y'all, a series of conversations about faith and life. The views expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of the Diocese of Savannah. Welcome to It's Catholic, Y'all. I'm Braylon Snow, and joining us today to officially introduce himself is our new Director of Formation and Catechesis, Paul Albert. Paul was one of the recent speakers at the National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis, which I got to go attend as well. And uh, so we'll hear from him about that experience. But first, let's meet our newest member of our diocesan team. Born and raised in Boston, Paul is a Haitian American whose family was deeply involved in the Haitian Catholic Charismatic Renewal. He and his wife, Anna, and their children have served as missionaries in Haiti, and Paul has served in both America and Haiti as the Director of Missions for Life Team, helping to form missionary disciples. Paul and Anna are the founders of Missionary Impulse, a small nonprofit that evangelizes through preaching the gospel and education. Paul has spoken on national and international stages for Life Team, the National Catholic Youth Conference, the Haitian Catholic Charismatic Renewal, the National Eucharistic Congress, and many others. Paul, welcome to the podcast and to the diocese. Thank you. So good to be here with you. I'm so excited. Praise God. Excellent. Um, all right. So for our listeners who haven't yet met you, uh, tell us a bit about your background, both in general and in, in your faith. Well, so yes, as you already said, born uh, in a Haitian household. My parents immigrated from from Haiti to America uh, about 50 years now. And we lived in Boston the whole time. I uh, moved out of Boston when I got married at the age of 25 uh, to become a life team missionary with my, my wife and I and now our, our five beautiful, amazing children. And we literally got married, went on a honeymoon, drove to uh, Cove Crest where we began our formation year there as a, as a married couple. So this is for the first time ever in our marriage that we lived outside of a mission community and jumping into this new role. And um, yeah, and we're excited for what, for what the Lord has in store for that. But a little bit about myself, right? Catholic education, my whole life, except for uh, the moments I was I was in school and I was in college. Uh, that, was, that was a public school, a private school, I should say. But uh, yeah, Catholic education my whole life. Uh, I have a passion to tell people about Jesus. <laughs> I love talking about the Lord and tell people about the Lord and sharing my own experience and encounter with him and moments of prayer with him and things of that nature. And I find myself right now in like my dream job, I would say, where I get to walk with others who are walking with uh, our young people in the church and adults and everyone in between and to be able to help them uh, and to be able to walk with them as, as they walk with others and give them some best practices, tips, and how to do it well and really how to preach the gospel well. That's fantastic. So I guess how did you, you mentioned your education, you mentioned a little bit about how you jumped in after getting married, but I guess how did you get involved with ministry specifically you know how did you think i want to do this first of all and then so that and then how did you get plugged in here with our diocese yeah so while in college uh, had a reversion so left home and went to florida and the school i was in florida at uh kind of the first time out of the house so i was like yes freedom i'm gonna do what i want it kind of went crazy to, to be honest um and made dumb decisions not wise decisions and had a reversion to a priest who did a real good job at, at, at loving me and walking with me and inviting me consistently. In fact, this priest found out that I had not yet been confirmed. He's like, Paul, we're going to start our CIA. And I want you, I think it'd be good if you'd be part of that. I was like, I don't know, Father, like maybe next year. And he consistently would invite me and find me in the dining room at the, at the school and find me in the library. I was like, this dude, I feel like you're following me. Like, what, what are you doing? Eventually, I just said yes <laughs> because I felt bad for him. But <laughs> little did I know that that yes would completely change change my life. And really, I remember our first formation session being on the edge of my seat as Father began to break open some truths of the church and some truths of our, of our Catholic faith. And I remember walking away like, why didn't I know this stuff? Catholic my whole life. My family extremely involved. And there was things that Father was saying. I was like, why has nobody told me this? And I just couldn't wait next week to show up to our CIA um, class again. And that began a process in my heart of like, all right, Lord, I- I'm going to give my life to you. And the day of my actual confirmation, it was uh, now Archbishop Winsky of Miami. He was a bishop of Orlando at that time. Went up. What is your name? Peter. P. 
Peter, be sealed with the Holy Spirit. And at that moment, I had what I like to call my uh, my, my personal Pentecost. At that moment, I felt the Lord do something in my in my heart. And I remember being at my confirmation with a group of my friends who we were going to go party after. That was the plan after confirmation. And I remember going, something has to drastically change in my relationship with them. Either they come to know the Lord uh, or... I'm gonna have to walk away and learn and get and get some new friends. Or the Lord give me a lot of patience and I could share what He's doing in my heart. And maybe eventually they would they would convert. So I found myself alone in my conversion. And after falling deeply in love with the Lord, I found myself alone because the group of friends I was with just weren't about that life. So I ended up moving back home and <laughs> drove my parents crazy there. Except they have accepted it now. But, right, they put all this money into my education, and I was going to school to be an airplane mechanic, and I've never once worked on a plane. I started working <laughs> out of parish immediately as a, as a uh, doing religious ed and work, working there, doing some youth ministry there as well, too, back, back in Boston. And it was just one thing after another. So it was religious ed, it was youth ministry, and it was just a lot of small invitations that the Lord had for me. And I just kept saying yes until eventually he brought me to missions and where I stayed for 13 years. Uh, on mission directly to, to teens, and then eventually move into a role where I was training missionaries to be able to minister directly to teens. Now, in my time with Life Teen, I came and across some people from this diocese, Father Kevin O'Keefe, uh, who's the vicar of our office, and uh, Caroline, actually, who's my boss, came up and did a retreat on at, at Cove Crest, which I was actually one of the speakers for, so it was kind of cool and that now I get to, to work with her. and. Well, on our retreat, just made some connections and one day saw that this job was posted. I was like, huh, Savannah, which is funny because I two years before that, I remember saying I would never work for a diocese. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, right. Tell God your plans, right? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I saw that. I saw that post. I was like, let me apply. See what happens. And upon applying again, that first phone call of, hey, we would like to speak to you about this. Immediately, I was like, all right. Lord, this is super clear that this is where, where you want me. Um, and the rest is history, and I'm here today. That's awesome. Well, we're glad you're here. What led to your involvement with the National Eucharistic Congress? Because uh, obviously you were plugged into that well before you came on here. Um, yeah, how did you get involved with that? So I think I was just blown away of what that team was trying to accomplish. And I was like, yes, the church needs this so bad. And uh, sometimes I have a lot of opinions. So I called a friend of mine who was involved with the Eucharistic Congress and was part of the leadership team there. And I was like, hey, as you guys do this, just make sure you don't forget about these things. Um, and one of the things that I mentioned was proper representation. I was like, this is for the whole church as a whole. So we have to make sure that our presenters and our speakers represent what the church looks like. And they were already way ahead of the game. They had already thought of that, so my opinion didn't matter. <laughs> but in that conversation, we were just we were just sharing, and I was just sharing my excitement of for the Eucharist Congress. And he goes, "Paul, do you want to be part of this? Like this? I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. What do you need? Like, I'll fold chairs and set up tables. Like, what What do you need? He's like, no, like maybe you should be one of our presenters. I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, not at all what I was asking for, but uh, and invited into that. I was like. Okay, and this happened a year and a half ago. I guess he and I had this conversation now, and it really didn't hit me until two, three months out. I was like, oh, this is a big deal. Like, this Eucharistic Congress, this revival at the church is, is launching is a big deal, and the Lord has allowed me to have to play a small role in it. And I was just extremely humbled by that. I was like, I can't believe, God, that you're allowing me to be to be, to be be part of this. And it was... um. Yeah, it was it was such a gift, such a blessing, and I'll share more about that later. But yeah, it was, it was a huge gift just to be to be part of that in the way that I was. I felt like that just even just attending and uh, covering for the diocese, you know, uh, just it was very humbling and very beautiful to be there. Uh, just for people who maybe haven't really been following the story or maybe haven't attended any of the things and uh, kind of involved with the revival in our diocese. A good summary of kind of what we've been doing as a church in America. Would you mind sharing just for people who aren't maybe as clear of what this event was? Yes. Uh, so it's a a lot of people say it's not an event. It's 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 a revival, and I, I would agree with that, right? This is not just a one and done thing. This is something that was 
supposed to and hopefully and I think has it has in my own heart definitely cause the movement of the Holy Spirit within the hearts of uh, Catholics here in America and beyond as we've had like different territories people from different territories of America come people from Guam and things of that nature so we're, we're also in attendance and so again not an event but really uh, a, a revival in, in, in a moment I love one of their taglines that the Eucharistic Congress uh, used was every movement has has a moment and, and this one is ours so it's supposed to spark revival within the hearts of Catholics in America and to Part of that revival is re sparking a love for Jesus in the Eucharist, which is right source and summit. We say this is it's the point of everything that we do as Catholics, and I would say that, and maybe some will argue otherwise, but I would say that as Catholics, we have kind of forgotten how important Jesus in the Eucharist is. Right, almost seventy percent of Catholics don't even believe in the true presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. They think it's simply a symbol. That is a problem. And that would explain why for every one Catholic joining the church, 6.45 are leaving. If you don't get what the the gift that the Eucharist truly is, then why would you stick around? You could go to any other church or and be part of any other group and still find fellowship, still find community. But what separates us from anything else and everything else, and I dare say every other religion, is that our God makes himself present to us each and every day in right, the Blessed Sacrament. And the revival was there to re-spark that, that love for Jesus in, in the Eucharist, that love for Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. It is also there to send Catholics out, to go out and to, and to be missionaries of the Eucharist. Go tell this good news that Jesus awaits you in every tabernacle, in every Catholic church across the world, that Jesus awaits you to have an encounter with you. But he not only waits for you there, he wants to give his very self to you. Right? He, he wants to allow you to come up. And when the priest says, or the, or the extraordinary minister says, the body of Christ, for you to say amen and to actually receive him and for him to take his place within the throne of, the, of, of your heart. And that is the point of, the, of, of this whole revival and this Eucharistic Congress is that, um, number one, as Catholics, we acknowledge the gift that this is. And number two, that we would go out and share that gift and be that gift to others as well. Yeah, yeah you're so right. I was just thinking amen the whole time. Um, <laughs> Uh, the whole idea of it not being an event, I, I feel that too, you know, sometimes when it is something it's just a big event that you're attending or kind of can get really excited about it. And then when it's over, there's sort of this plummeting effect and you're like, oh, it's over. Now what? When I left, uh, when I left, it just felt like the momentum had built and it wasn't over at all. It was just sort of like, we're just continuing this now. This is something to... Um, look forward to for the next day, year, decade, uh, however long until we meet our Lord, right? Um, so I did want to say that um, some of the Congress talks are available online. Uh, we don't know that yours is yet, or maybe it will be. We'll see. I think there will be audio. Okay. Of it. Um, but in case people aren't able to access that at some point, could you share some of your message that you presented on during the impact session? So yeah, in a nutshell, my the topic I was given to pray about and to present on was how to sustain missionary zeal and joy after the Congress, which yeah. I think is which I think is important, Excellent. right? Because yeah. again, this mountaintop experience, this mountaintop encounter, it is very easy for us to come off the mountain and just forget. But how do we sustain what we were experiencing there at at uh, at, at, at this Congress? And in a nutshell, what I shared is uh, really three major things: the need for communion with our church and the need for communion for our local church, right? We are not meant to operate on our own. We need to be in communion with our bishops. We need to be in communion with our local pastors. And that is how we operate as, as a church. So we need to be in communion with our church and in obedience to our, to our diocese and to our, to our pastors who are there to, to shepherd us. Secondly, as Catholics, there has to be a need for, for prayer, right? We, we have to live a life of prayer. Um, prayer is not necessary for our relationship with Jesus, but prayer is our relationship with Jesus. If I'm in a relationship with someone and I never once sit down and have a conversation with them, uh, then what kind of relationship is that? So we need to set up a uh, routine of prayer or, or a rhythm of prayer, I would say, and plan for what that looks like each and every single day of our life. Not just simply, I'll pray when I have time, but no, like a blessing we have here at the Pastoral Center is Mass every day. And we have a chapel available to us, right? Part of my plan is, 
hey, before work, even if it's just 15 minutes, I'm going to walk into the chapel and I'm going to sit with Jesus for 15 minutes. And a non-negotiable, I will go to mass. It's being made available to us. Why would I not seize that opportunity? And I pray at home with my family when I, at, the, at the end of the day. So what does our rhythm of prayer look like? And that, that rhythm of prayer is on a daily basis. That rhythm of prayer is also seasonal. What are the things I'll do during the season of Lent, during the season of Advent, during the season of Easter, and whatever uh, liturgical time we're living into in, in, in the church. So what does my rhythm of prayer look like as, as an individual? And um, the third point that I made too was, again, communion with our bishops and our pastors is important. We're not meant to do this alone. And part of that is also the need for community. And again, Jesus, who was God, decided, hey, I'm not going to do this alone. I'm going to pick 12 to be with me. If Jesus really recognized the importance of having 12 with him, we at least need two or three other people to be sharing this yeah. life with and to be walking with and to be walking with us as well, too. We cannot do it alone. And if we do, the reality is we're going to be burnt out. And um, but we're, we're going to fail at, mission, at our mission. We have to be able to do this communally. Um, and from that place of obedience to our bishop, obedience to our pastor, within the place of community, within from, from a place of prayer, then we're able to go out and be on mission together as one church and invite others into this beautiful experience that hopefully we are living as well. That's beautiful. Yeah, I appreciate it. So what are some things or maybe one thing, big or small, that you experienced at the Congress that really made an impact on you? Oh, man, where do I start? All right, <laughs> where do you start? There are so many, and uh, more than one might come out as I share. So, so I apologize ahead of time. <laughs> Bring it on. That'd be great. I... So again, like I said, I had some friends who were involved in the leadership team of this of this Congress, and they had communicated to me some of the things that were going to take place there. And I was like, oh, that's cool in conversation. Sunday liturgy, though, right? The Indianapolis Orchestra, I believe it was. Whoever it was, the orchestra was there. I did not imagine how impactful that mass would have been. Right? I've been to mass with thousands of people before. Never 60,000, however many were there. I've been with four or five up to 20,000 before. The procession, and I literally timed this, from Bishop walking up on the altar and kissing the altar, it took 28 minutes. <laughs> and then they incensed the altar. So it took 30 minutes before we blessed ourselves with the sign of the cross. So 30 minutes for the 2,000 priests, the 250 bishops to process in for us to begin Mass. And I remember just looking at priest after priest and bishop after bishop processing. I was like, this is our church. This is our church. And in different songs that were being played, a mixture of these super reverend, uh, these super like traditional hymns and then these uh, more contemporary hymns, but all being sung with such great reverence and appreciation for what is taking place. And I don't know if I can even explain it well, but the, this idea of 60,000 Catholics together in one room singing praises to God and preparing ourselves to enter into these sacred mysteries, as we say in the liturgy, was just breathtaking. So that mass on, on, on Sunday, I was just, I, I was blown away by it. And to conclusion, the homily was amazing. <laughs> uh, the cardinal who gave the homily was, uh, he, it was, it was so great. And then again, another time within that liturgy, a similar experience of watching Catholic after Catholic go up and receive Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament at the moment of communion. And then at the end, when Bishop Cousin came out and gave and says and said thank you to to, to, to people and to the Cardinal and to all the priests that were there and to other bishops that were there. Um, again, that just was like the cherry on top of like, uh, wow, this we have just completed this this moment in history and. The church in America will never be the same ever again. In fact, I texted one of my friends who was involved in the planning of this, and I said just that to her. I was like, because of the yes and because of what you have done, the church in America will no longer be the same. Like, you have literally changed our church um, for the better, hopefully change our country for the better if we all go out and live out this, this mission. And, yeah, I was just, so that, that Sunday liturgy was just, it was just breathtaking. One of the uh, staff members, of the conference was sitting right in front of my family and I, and she was the one I had been emailing with back and forth, and she was just in tears as the Sunday liturgy was happening. And I could just imagine 
what was happening in her heart. I'm like, ah, years, at least a year and a half, months of planning. And it all came to this moment of fruition within within our closing liturgy on Sunday. And I can just imagine the joy that was happening in her heart was probably just exploding with joy of like, all right, not, not we did it, but Lord, you did it. You did it. And mm-hmm. you showed up each and every single time. Um, and that's not to mention the adorations at, at the evening sessions, the, the, the morning liturgy that took place each day in different languages and different rites, and the amazing presenters. Uh, uh, what, what's his name? Jonathan Rumi. I almost called him Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Jonathan Rumi, uh, his, his, his reading of John 6 and the voice of Jesus from the chosen was, again, right, that uh, allowed my whole being and my imagination to enter into, into prayer in a way that I've never entered into it before. So it was, it's hard to pick one moment, but if I had to, it would be it would be the closing liturgy. When I learned about how the Mass is living out what's happening in heaven, I, I said, that's so beautiful. But then seeing it in that scale, mm-hmm. like you said, there are multiple languages we were singing in every day. People from all backgrounds are in this building. And you're seeing these people in dressed in white and, and the kind of like this heavenly garments walking through. And it really does give an image to, and that's just the very basic glimpse, you know, to mm-hmm. what we'll get to experience in heaven. And it's great, you know, cause that's good news that all of us, I'm sure all of us could have stayed the whole night, you know, that in those last <laughs> evenings of adoration, no one wanted to leave. And I think that's, again, pointing us to eternity. Yeah. I, I love how you talk about, right, it's, it's, this, it's this image of heaven. And that was such a great moment. I'm like, I, I can't imagine what heaven's like. Like, I'm just... <laughs> yeah. And um, so, yeah, it's this, it, man, yeah, it was a gift. <laughs> it's such a blessing. So, yeah. What would be your big takeaway from the Congress for the church at large? Uh, and then... Also, what do you think about the big announcement that they made at the end for our 11th Congress in 2033? Yeah, so I, my, my big takeaway is, and I, I already thought this, but there's just now even a greater conviction and a greater urgency. Our Catholic faith is too beautiful. And what the Lord offers us in and through our Catholic faith and in and through the Catholic Church is too beautiful to not make sure the whole world knows, right? But it, the danger is that is I, could, I could be overzealous and get lost. I'm like, the whole world has to know about this, but really those right before me have to know about this, right? We just moved to the diocese and we're a couple of days into our new home that we, live, that we live in. And I'm like, those neighbors to the left and the right of me that I just moved next to, they need to know about this. And that's, that's where I need to start. So my hopes for myself is that uh, this joy, this beauty, this this excitement that I experienced at the conference, um, for lack of a better word, that I would not chicken out <laughs> and be afraid to share that with others, right? And w- w- with everyone, whether it's someone who is of Catholic, who, who, who same faith with me, whether it's the person that works in the office right next to me, or whether it's the neighbor that lives on the same street with me or across the street from me, that I would be willing to share that with everyone. And, and I hope in hopes that everybody else would do the same too, um, that they would share, everyone who's part of that Congress and even those who weren't, but that they would share the gift that our church is and how Jesus gives himself to us over and over and over again, specifically in and through the Blessed Sacrament. I think another thing too, uh, as I look at even at, at our diocese or the, even the, the greater church, right? there's a, I would say something that most people would agree with, our priests are extremely busy. There's not enough of them. We need to pray for vocations. But something I moved in my own heart is there is a need for the Blessed Sacrament to be even more present. So what does creating moments of adoration look like in our parishes? There's a need for the sacraments to be more readily available. Uh, what are, what does adding more confession times, longer confession times look like? Right, Because again, it goes hand in hand. I need to get forgiveness for my sins so I could receive Jesus in a, with, a, with a clean heart and um, a clean soul. So what, 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 what does that look like? But again, as I look at our priests who we don't have enough of, who are busy, who are pastoring several churches in different missions and are wearing several hats in the diocese, 
it is our role as laity to be able to walk up to our priest and be like, I am at your service. What can I do for you as my pastor, as my priest in my parish, to free you up so that you could sit in a confessional longer, so you could add another mass time, so that you could expose Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament more often? What can I do for you? And I think it's something we need to really pray about, because again, remind you, our priests are busy. So if you walk up to a priest and go, Father, I'm here to serve, what can I do? Um, he's gonna be like, I, I don't know, like, there's so much. Or if you walk up to a, a priest and you're like, Father, I have this bright idea of a new mystery, which is, not, again, overwhelming. But the question, what we need to do is, Father, these are my giftings. I, I feel like the Lord's calling me to be a catechist. How can I help with that? Or, Father, I have a weird gift and I love spreadsheets. I don't understand anyone who does love spreadsheets. God bless them. But, Father, I love spreadsheets. Uh, can I come in and do some data entry for you? Can I come in and help with finance? I have a background in accounting. I'll be your business manager. Whatever, whatever, whatever it is that that priest needs. To not only to not only make yourself available, but suggest as well, Father, I can help you with this specific thing. That seems to be that seems to be having you busy. A reminder: a priest went to seminary. They studied theology and philosophy, not business, not accounting, not all these other th things that they have to do in order to run parishes. So how can we support them in that? And in supporting them in that, hopefully that frees them up to make Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament and Jesus through all the other sacraments more readily available to his people. Um, so uh, you already laid out quite a few things that we have to look forward to and how we can be thinking about that um, for our diocese. But what are maybe some specifics in our diocese? I mean, you're, you're brand new, so you're getting to know the needs of what's here. But just from your conversations, what are some things we can be, um, I guess, maybe praying for or things to look forward to in the next few months or beyond? Uh, Yes, 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 fiat, 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 yes, yes, yes. <laughs> give your yes, give your fiat as Mary did to the mission that the Lord has entrusted to you. The church exists to evangelize, Pope Paul VI tells us. The church exists to evangelize. We as baptized Catholics are baptized into the church. Therefore, we are to partake in the mission of the church. Therefore, we too exist to evangelize. Pope Francis tells us to enjoy the gospel that uh, missionary uh, is not just a badge that we put on and take off whenever it's convenient, but it's, it's ingrained in who we are. So if you are baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, my brothers and sisters, you are a missionary, right? Dundale, Matthew 28, go make disciples of all nations. So we need people in our diocese to be committed to the mission of forming disciples, of forming missionary disciples. We need people in our diocese to get involved with religious education uh, at uh, on the parish level. We need people in our diocese to get involved with youth ministry on the parish level, with college ministry, it, 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 to be agents of God's grace for the people of God. Here's the beauty, as Pope Francis tells us, you don't need a theology degree or even long moments of study in order to go out and to preach the gospel. Start with sharing your story and how the Lord has transformed your life uh, and how you have encountered him. Cause, because that nobody can argue. Nobody could come to me and say, Paul, you did not encounter Jesus in that moment of adoration. You did not encounter Jesus in that scripture. You weren't there. I encountered Jesus and you can't argue that. And here's how I encountered him. And I think he wants to encounter you in a similar way as well, or maybe in a completely different way if you're open to that. So get involved on the parish level. Get involved on the parish level. I guarantee you, your parish is in need of catechists. I guarantee you your parish is in need of volunteers to help with youth ministry. And if you're like, I can't speak to people, I'm nervous, I don't want to talk about it, I guarantee you, you're some, somewhere in your parish, somebody, they need someone to show up and to just help cook for youth ministry or to, uh, or to drive teens to an event, whatever it may be. Get involved on your parish level. Um, again, call your priest, call your leadership director, call your youth minister, and make yourself readily available to them, again, so that they can be freed up to make Jesus more available to, to others. But the church needs you. And unfortunately, and I don't if this might be too direct, uh, no is not an option. Um, we, we have to say yes. And I think that's what the example of our Blessed Mother, that's what we're invited to, right? She, Mary said yes to a crazy mission that forever changed the world, to a mission that could have gotten her killed. Um, we're not telling you to go out and be martyred. <laughs> um, that's the invitation the Lord has for you, then praise God. But uh, for most of us, that's not the case. But Mary, that's the risk Mary took. She literally put her life on the line so that our lives could be forever transformed by Jesus Christ. 
So give your yes as Mary did. Give your fiat as as Mary did. And everyone has the at least the ability to pray, right? Amen. Just, yeah. Oh well, yeah. Just rewinding back to what you were talking about the community, how it feeds into evangelization is just a tangent, but totally related to that point. How these events, not events, revivals, these moments, <laughs> these encounters, uh, how it's just such a natural way to evangelize. It's these moments that we do gather and have these things happen as a community that feed because it's a natural way to have a conversation with someone. Why are you here in this city? I think I told at least two Uber drivers all about this event and I was just so excited about it. You know, there was, I didn't feel like I even had a choice. It just started coming out of my mouth. And, um, you know, when you have these moments when we're all together, that community aspect, it's encouraging. It gives you courage to share because it's so good and you know what you've seen. Mm. But it's also just, oh my, my brothers and sisters, they, they had this too. It's not just me, although if it was just me, it'd still be worth sharing. But a bunch of people had this too. Yeah, and, and, and not to cut you off, I, I love how you talk about your Uber drivers. One of the things that we shared uh, with missionaries was uh, what we call a three minute testimony or an elevator pitch testimony. So if you're in an elevator with somebody, are you ready to, uh, that 90 seconds that you're in an elevator with them, if you have longer, the three minutes that you have with them, to share your re- the reason for your faith? And the reason why you believe and uh it's funny but forming and training missionaries in this for years and the lord at the eucharist of congress right after check-in lugging suitcases after a long drive and i'm tired and all i want to do is get to my bed the lord gave you an opportunity mm-hmm. uh the guy a guy in the elevator he's like oh so what are you here for and uh i'm like oh, dude i don't want to talk <laughs> <laughs> i immediately the holy spirit entered my heart um, and i was like what oh, dude what are you doing and I'm like, I'm here for the Eucharistic Congress. And I left it at that. And he goes, a lot of people are here for that. What What is this about? And I'm like, okay, Lord, I get it now. And in 45 seconds maybe, I, I shared with this guy, that this is what it is. This is what we believe as Catholics. And this is what I'm here. And this is my involvement in this. And he's like, that's real interesting. Now, I don't know what's going to come of that conversation. <laughs> maybe he'll Google this stuff later and be touched and be transformed. But he asked a question. He asked a personal question, gave him a personal answer on what was on what's taking place in the city and why all these people are checking into his hotel and why the hotel is completely sold out. And hopefully God does something with that. Hopefully a seed was planted with that as well. And I think they can probably tell the difference between this giant event and all the other giant events that they tend to have because they have a lot in that city. Correct. I think people could feel the difference, and I've heard people say that they could tell this was a different experience. Mm. Um, all right, so... Thank you so much for sharing about that. I just wanted to ask a few fun questions here at the end. Um, <laughs> one, here are some of your favorite saints, or maybe who are your favorite wow. saint friends. Why? Are they your friends? <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe some fun facts about you, or you know, about um, fun facts people don't know. Favorite saint. Uh, let's see. So my kids' names are Nathaniel Joseph, Therese Marie, Michael Maximilian, John Vianney, and Moses Augustus. All saint names. Wow. And I would say those are my favorite saints. Really? Um, specifically Nathaniel. Uh, his, his, the name, his name was beautiful. That's another story for another time. But his middle name is what I truly love. We love St. Joseph as a family. And I owe so much of my vocation to St. Joseph as a husband and as a father. And yeah, love love St. Joseph. Therese, uh, Therese of Lisieux is who my daughter is named after. And she... <laughs> so part of our formation as Life Team Missionaries was to... We read Story of a Soul, and uh, we break that open and do a book study on, on that. So as a missionary, I was formed in that. As mission director, I was able to help form others in that. And I would say both as a formator and as someone in formation, uh, Therese actually struggled with. <laughs> and I was, I'm like, this girl's weird. Her love for Jesus is weird. But at the same time, I can't tell you how many times moments of that formation would come back up. She's Yes, she was weird. Yes, she was different. But there's something that I loved about her as well, too. Uh, so much so that I named my daughter after her. Michael, we were missionaries in Haiti. Spiritual warfare is a big thing in Haiti. And we named him after St. Michael the Archangel because we were in a time of deep spiritual warfare and um, just really fighting for souls in Haiti at that time. And why, why not? And Maximilian Kobe, we also love his story. And then Moses Augustus, uh, his name is, as we named these, uh, our kids who were like, People are like, well, who's he named after? 
like all of them. <laughs> yes. well, who did they have to We didn't have to Therese. We didn't have to Teresa. We all, all of them. They they could. We want all of them interceding for them. But Moses, uh, Augustus is uh, in particular is Moses the Ethiopian or Moses the Black, and just love his story. Crazy story. I encourage you guys to go Google it. I won't do justice to it. But he basically defended a whole bunch of monks until he lost his life. And then Augustus Tolton. Um, amazing priest, amazing black priest with a beautiful story as well too. I encourage you to go uh, Google his story and just how this man literally gave his life for the, for, for, for the gospel and actually died because of how hard he worked. <laughs> so in order to have the gospel preach amongst a, a lot of persecution, both here in America and uh, in Europe and in other places as well too. So I would say as of now, those are our favorite saints and which is why we named our kids after them. That's awesome. That's so great. I mean, we talked about having friends in high places. <laughs> Something people might not guess about you. Favorite Man. food. <laughs> Favorite movie, anything well, like I, that. I love anything buffalo. <laughs> Food-wise. Oh, yeah. Buffalo wings. Love buffalo wings. I have a deep desire, and I don't know if I would actually do it, but there's a deep desire to go skydiving. Oh, really? A okay. deep desire. <laughs> I'm also terrified of heights, which is why oh. I think I have that desire. I'm like, that's my way of battling it. So a deep <laughs> desire to go skydive. So if anyone else owns a plane or a skydiving company, call me up. <laughs> I was going to say, you, were, uh, <laughs> you studied airplanes, uh, right? So Correct. I guess that works. So yeah, deep, cool. deep desire to go to go skydiving. That's a random fact. And uh, I don't think my wife would agree with me going. <laughs> but if someone so if, uh, offers, and I can't say no, right? You got to accept the gener generosity of others. Um, she's going to kill me when she hears this. But that's okay. <laughs> So yeah, deep desire to go skydiving. <laughs> Random fact. <laughs> awesome, that's great. All right, well, um, I just wanted to mention to people, for people who are listening here, uh, if you're curious about the Congress, uh, you want to maybe see about looking up some of the recorded talks and experience, you can go to eucharisticcongress.org, or you can go to EWTN's YouTube channel to watch some of those recordings. Um, Paul, I just want to thank you for being on the podcast. Uh, we're really excited to have you here in our diocese and uh, for what the world has in store. It is so good to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Sure. This has been an episode of It's Catholic, Y'all. Visit us at diosav.org or on our Diosav social media platforms for more.